Video games. What up, dudes, and welcome back to the Overdue Games Podcast. I'm Matt. And I'm Andrew. And once again, thank you to all our generous patrons who kept us going for over 400 episodes. Yeah, if you're interested in becoming a patron at any level, please check out patreon.com slash Podcast. Due to the week is SFW, which I'm assuming means safe for work. All right. Could, I could am, be well, your initials. I hope well, you're safe. I am not, and this, and this podcast skirts the line of being safe for work completely there was like two episodes where we tried really hard not to cuss <laughs> you cannot listen to us in the office nah it's it's not gonna happen so you know okay so getting all that aside you know i, I we wanted to have a good week you know it'd be nice if we had a good week we nice to have like something positive to talk about you know it would be cool if we had a hype episode no the industry's not gonna let us have a hype episode not yet not, not yet, yet. So, I guess we'll start off on the most all three all three of the major players just went through some something some um, sort of big news came yeah I guess I guess we'll start on the least the least uh dark and depressing let's just talk about we'll, let's talk about Nintendo they had their big uh, uh investors meeting last night yesterday in Japan right um the president tried to get out in front of it and apparently he's a little like he was very he was very aware and very annoyed he did not want to answer any questions anyone actually had for him <laughs> but but um he wanted to no comment his way out of this yeah so because but he 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 tried to his credit i think you know the, the nice thing was is he put they put out a statement they put it out on their like even had it go go public in the middle of the night here on their on their twitter their official twitter right um the old nintendo tweet right in and, the dead of the night well the thing is because it for, like immediately was a a uh a japanese uh tweet all and then it immediately was followed up by an english version of that tweet um just to like you know be straight up forthcoming i'm trying to like find the exact wordage here they've, they've got so many things it's like already buried um but uh he basically said you know we don't need to read you know paraphrasing is fine i guess we're going to have a new switch. I'm not talking about it now. So they've officially said it exists. They have it acknowledged. Like he's like, it was nine years ago. Awada announced the switch March, 2015. You know, it's been nine years since then we're going to announce a new one. It's not going to be now. And he said, we'll do it before the end of our fiscal, which is important because that's March 31st, 2025. Um, which means he doesn't have to announce it before the holidays. Like it, said fiscal year so he could announce it in january oh i misunderstood and then he said we will have a direct next month like so the which is also weird because nintendo usually never tells you a month in advance when they're having a direct but he said we're gonna have a direct well, they always have one in june but it's like we're gonna have a direct in june we're gonna have one next month there will be nothing on the new system then it is all gonna be just switch games like original right switch. okay so he basically came out and said look yes we have a new system we will talk about it at some point, like, but we are not talking about it now, and we are not talking about it next month. You know, we're going to talk about just Switch releases next month, and then I and before the fiscal year ends on March thirty first, I will we will officially announce the new system. But didn't they release the last Switch in March? Right. But I think they could be easily playing by the exact same playbook, and they would, you know, they they frankly they they could do the exact same thing, which is. They'll give you this this trailer in October, and then in January they actually have a full press release blowout, and then and they'll it, announce and yeah. the announce and the release date is in March. So they could be doing the same thing. They could also, and I think it's 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 we got to really take the word. We'll announce it before the end of fiscal. You got to really take that to heart. Um, he didn't say the system would be the system itself would be out before the end of fiscal he just right. said he'll announce it so they could easily you you know you could easily read that as he'll announce it in spring next year and it'll come out at fall 2025 or something i don't think that's happening um but um the other thing you got to really read here is that he doesn't want to talk about it because he doesn't want to screw the sales over i guarantee he didn't want to want to say shit about this system at all 
Right. But I think he, like, they being so quiet and coy, like they, they kind of did it to themselves. Like one, you know, you know, when you're making a new system, you have dev kits, you have people out there with it. Like, you know, you have a lot of moving parts and like all your know, NVIDIA and Samsung and whoever else. Right. Like it's going to get known. Like you can't, you can't really hide anything from people anymore. But that stuff has to be out by now. If they're talking about releasing in the next year or two. Right. So basically like the way I look at it is like he knew everyone knows there's a new system coming. The writing's all on the wall. They've been very coy about what they're doing. They've had a very, you know, small release, like a lot of just ports and remasters. The investors are coming into their meeting and what's he supposed to tell them? Like, um, no, we have nothing planned. <laughs> right. See, so the, so the investors are going to be like, what's going on? Like, because the reality is, is that the system is declining. It's declining year over year, you know, because it hit its peak. And now it's now the thing is, it's great. It's it's actually doing a, sl a slow decline. It's not like dropping off the face of the earth. Right. So that's good. That's actually good. You, like, you know, you can't you, you can't expect an infinite growth. And boy, will we get to that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh well in some ways the internet makes it impossible to hide and that's good and in other ways the internet makes it impossible to hide and that's kind of a pain in the ass and bad right and and, and investors there's a lot of gamer investors now too that they're they're hyper aware of right um, there's some people who are, who are avid video gamers who have a lot of money and bought a lot of shares and they and they're gonna be like where's where's the system dude like <laughs> like you quit hiding it so i think he was i think he didn't want to make this announcement but I think he had to. Right. And I think this was the only way he could sit there. I'm like, I'm going to put out a statement. And it's just a statement. There's nothing media attached to it. And it's just going to be this very, I will, yes, it's happening. I will tell you about it later. It will not be at our next direct. It's the most indignant CEO about having to talk to investors. It's, it's sort of crazy because it, it feels like Nintendo wants to be a private company. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like they have yeah. no desire to be a publicly traded company, but they wanted the prestige and the money of being publicly traded, I guess. I don't Yeah. <laughs> kind of wild. It's one of the only companies you can think of where you're just like they have they hate investors more than anyone else. <laughs> they really do have disdain for them, like the way I do. But I mean, like it's funny they only have disdain for them because you know, they'll, they'll ask them just like the most basic question of like, so what are you doing? <laughs> how you, how you plan to make money? You know, like they, they kind of want to be like, look, we're Nintendo. We're, we're the best brand in the world. Just give us money, invest in us and, and it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Like totally trust me guys. Mm -hmm. Like just, you know, I'm good for it. Just, just, you know, don't worry. Just take, <sighs> just, just give me your money. So I don't know if Japan or Japanese publicly traded companies are the exact same way, but like if you're invested here, uh, you get an investor report at the end of the year and then you get to vote on stuff as an investor. And so they have to provide you with like clear financials, clear information about like projections for the future, plans for the future, so that you can vote on what you think should or should not happen. Um Mm -hmm. And I think they do because, again, they, they operate on the stock market in America. So, yeah. So it makes me wonder how much uh, because as much disdain as they have for them, they can't totally disregard their investors like they must not like providing those reports. No company does, I suppose. But, you know, given how much information is usually included in those reports, you think we would know a lot more about when what the plan is for the switch. To be totally yeah. honest, well, the thing is, like they're they're planning to try to get to 155 million, you know, by the end of next March. They want to sell about 13 and a half more sw million switches. Ooh, um, that's pretty steep amount, though. Well, it wouldn't have been. Life. It wouldn't have been steep if not for the fact that it's been this many years. Now it's a little bit like the problem is here is that like they did officially acknowledge the existence. There is a successor coming. And hell, we're, we will tell you about the successor before the end of the fiscal year. So anyone who's slightly savvy or is going to read anything, because that, that, that's been all over the news already, is that like there's a new Switch coming. They have officially acknowledged it. Right. It's no longer like rumors says Nintendo's going to make, which of course they're going to make a new system. But like now they have officially commented, yes, there's going to be a new system. So Switch is on its way out. Like it's officially on its way out now. There's no getting around that. You buying a switch now, you're buying a system at the ass end of its life. 
And what they should have done is just drop the price, but they won't. And I think yeah. that's that, that's what's going to make it harder to sell that that last 13 and a half million because they only sold like 2 million in the last three months. Given how old the console is, they could easily drop the price and maintain the same profit margin. But then they're losing out on the bigger profit margin they have now. Yeah, no, I, I understand that they want all of the money. Everybody does. But like we're, we're entering this time where we haven't seen this in probably 30 years where companies are legitimately going to have to compete by lowering their profit margin again. We're like, you're not going to like it hasn't been since the 90s, not fast food. Like no company has done this since the 90s. And it's like, you're going to see that again. And they're all going to drag their feet. They're not going to want to do it. But the first company that like starts competing in that way and sees a big return or sees a large increase in its like market share. Oh, man. Oh, like you're going to see like all sorts of profit margins getting cut with the idea that volume is going to make up for it. Mm -hmm. And Nintendo will be the last ones to do it. But I, I sort of see that happening in the industry in general. And there's a lot of reasons why I think the gaming industry, which already has sort of razor thin margins to begin with all entertainment yeah. does. But like, I think the gaming industry is going to have that similar, like 1986 drop mm -hmm. off and they're going to have to find a new way to reinvent. And it's like, it's sad because it's right at the peak of, you know, video games being, the largest entertainment in yeah the like we're in we're in well i mean that is the the core theme of this episode i guess is like the industry's fucked yeah. um <laughs> the, because it is like the largest entertainment you know sector um that there is like the large I part, remember, yeah right it may, and yet it's it's doing horrible like it is it is beyond unhealthy right now um, but yeah, I guess there really isn't much more to talk about other than with Nintendo and that other than like, okay, well, you know, good luck selling your last 13 and a half million. Um, yeah, uh, well, this is a, this is a theory of mine is that, uh, every industry that's been infected by tech executives, which includes the entertainment industry at large, but especially video games and movies is going to have like a come to Jesus moment where they realize that the shit that tech, the tech world has been doing for you know, 15 to 20 years, uh, ruined their industries. It's sort of like how you can have a $200 million movie that's going to streaming and everyone goes, how the fuck was it so expensive? And it looks like a $30 million Hollywood movie. And it's like, and, and I saw this from a different industry uh, critic was saying like, well, it's because all the movie stars still got to make their, you know, make their nut. And now they're just getting paid up front rather than, the deals, the sustainable tail end deals yeah. that they had in the past. Well, that's true in every industry, but the entertainment industry, especially like that tail end is what made it sustainable as an industry period. And all that's going away mostly because tech philosophy, tech industry philosophy has infected every part of the entertainment, you know, industry at large. I, I guess, do we separate like, do we say video game industry is not a part of the entertainment industry at large? I mean, it is. It is. Right, it is. Right. But like, do we separate it like academically? If I say the entertainment industry, are you immediately like video games are included in that? Or I do think you just so. think music and movies? I personally think so. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It makes sense to me that way. I just wondered if I have to keep saying both, but the entertainment industry entirely is infected that way. And we're now coming back to like, yeah. Uh, streaming platforms are like, oh, hey, we got to go back to the cable model. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, it's it's you saw the movie, I didn't. You know that that Fall Guy movie came out, not not Fall Guy's video game, Fall Guy with yeah with uh, right, and, and it did didn't do super well. It didn't, it bleh, and then like the budget was huge, and I'm like, maybe the problem is why did that movie cost like 140 or 150 dollars to make? It didn't look like a, did not look from, from maybe that's a marketing you know, faux pas or whatever. Like I, I get it. There's stunts in the movie, but like at no point in looking at that movie, do I sit there and go like, wow, $140 million. All right. Like, uh, like, like the amount of like other bigger movies that have come out, you know, granted inflation's a thing or whatever, but like 
other movies, effects heavy movies that have come out costing that same amount. Well, this is know. very much what I was talking about, where it's like the the movie stars are getting paid up front instead of a cut of theater sales or a cut I, of I guess, but how much of 140 is 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 Ryan Gosling and Emily Blunt taking home? A good amount. A good amount. A good amount. You think half? Mm, I wouldn't say half, but easily 30%. Easily. Yeah, and the thing is, is I don't know if they're including the marketing budget in that because they they often lie. No, they say like, "Oh, we're not," or "We are," or whatever. Yeah. Um, the other thing to remember with it, and while the majority of the stunts and effects are done live as an homage to stuntmen and effects teams, um, there is still visual effects in that movie. Yeah. There's still plenty of that, and visual effects is expensive. It takes massive teams to get shit done mm. on time. So I'm not going to pretend that I know exactly why it costs $130 million to make and only made $28 million in its opening week. Uh, but movies like that used to have eight to ten weeks to make money. Right Now they have four tops. Most of them only get like two weeks. So, uh, duh, of course it's going to fail. The reason why the stars take it up front yeah. is then... They sell the streaming rights to make up a, uh, the majority of their profit on those yeah. movies. They're hoping. Well, I, I I think from the beginning, I think when before that movie shot one day of filming, you probably should have sat down and been like, "This is your budget. Your budget is sixty million dollars or something." Uh, usually, yes, that's what happens. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, usually exactly like I think whoever decided that, yeah, sure, we'll go a hundred million or more for this movie was probably that was probably the that was a bad idea. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, the thing is, is it it seems obvious, but it's it's not when the entire system, you know, we're talking about changing the course of a glacier, not changing yeah. the course because like, every every department is going to tell you how invaluable they are and how much they need to be paid this x amount of millions of dollars now the the truth of the matter is is that anything below the line doesn't get a whole lot of say in how much of the budget they get mm. they squabble when they argue but the truth of the matter is is that the real big changes in budget happen because of above the line talent directors mm. producers stars um you know and the thing is is fall guy is very fun like it is a good time movie you're going to see it. You're going to have a great time watching it. Like they have a whole joke in there about third act problems that I really love because most action movies today put themselves in a corner where the third act is sort of a mess where like they can't answer the questions. And so a big problem in the fake movie that Ryan Gosling's working on that Emily Blunt's directing is like they can't figure out how to solve the third act problem. And the stunt guys are like, well, make the third act really, really fun and nobody will talk about it until later. And it's like, well, that's what they do. They get to the third act and you're in a corner. And so they just make it super fun. Um, you know, the movie is good and worth seeing. And I wish more people saw it in theaters. Although the problem with theaters these days is nobody remembers how to act in a fucking theater. That's in, awesome. In <laughs> yeah. My screening at uh, at a like indie theater chain, like a, a chain where like you would imagine people go because they want the original theater experience. You had people like, answering their fucking phones <laughs> like like somebody literally answered their phone in the theater and was like oh yeah sorry i'm in a movie the fuck get out of your fucking what the what the fuck <laughs> some alamo draft house people there like just kick them out yeah. watch them uh but uh, all on the side i think we're gonna see a major shuffle and these consequences that we're seeing here uh, you know uh, We'll we'll jump into Microsoft probably last because Sony's situation, I do think, is connected to this, but is more funny than Microsoft's situation. Yeah, well, let's talk about Sony here for a little bit because, again, I think a lot of people, because of today, they're going to forget the fact that Sony laid off. They didn't shut down, but they laid off people from Guerrilla Games, Insomniac, and Naughty Dog, and these are your biggest, most high-profile, most successful, and no one's been a bit bigger workhorse for Sony than Insomniac games. Like no one's done more for them in the last, you know, seven years than, than Insomniac games. Um, yeah, they, they definitely, yeah. I would yeah. Spider-Man, they had Miles Morales remastered Ratchet and Clank, Spider-Man two, and they need to suffer losses. They need to let people go. But also Gorilla games that. definitely has done a lot for Sony. None of these guys are gorillas done a ton of yeah. stuff, you know, with, with her, the horizons and the yeah. patches and Horizon two and the DLC. And then, 
I and the funny thing is, is I would say that Gorilla has done more for the brand for Sony's brand with its games than Insomniac has done. Yeah, people forget both Horizons games have sold over 10 million copies. Yeah. Like it's one of those like kind of like almost like Avatar situations where it's like, no, when you, if you want to break down the numbers, like we're talking like 10 million plus people or more bought each Horizon game. Like, right. yeah, boy, boy, it sure does suck how like Horizon 1 came out right, you know, right at the same time as Breath of the Wild and got and lost all its, you know, publicity and elden ring did the same thing to horizon 2 but it's like oh no but don't 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 worry they sold 10 million copies or more yeah they still did great and again very much sony's brand for the last i don't know eight years or whatever has like horizon's been a big part of that aloy yeah. as a character uh the horizon zero dawn you know machine animals are iconic to sony in all of their yeah you know, marketing materials. So it's like, uh, I would, I would definitely agree that insomniac has been a backbone for Sony for a decade. Um, but gorilla is like, sometimes you see people online being like, Oh, well, uh, gorilla. Okay. But insomniac, how could you get rid of people from there? And it's like, well, what do you mean? Gorilla? Okay. Gorilla is, uh, is an industry leader on games. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> The, like exactly. they've designed two of the biggest games of the last 10 years easily um it is weird that sony is making moves that sort of seem well everybody's doing this but it seems like sony's making moves that seems like they have no real plan they don't know what to do jim ryan left us and now we have no idea what to do and you could make the argument that jim ryan didn't know what he was doing either at the end whoever came up with their 10-year plan you know, 15 years ago was the last plan they ever had kind of thing. And I don't know that that's necessarily true, uh, but it does seem like the last year Sony's been flailing. Like their biggest plan is just try to beat Microsoft in a court case. But yeah. otherwise, like they haven't really made any moves that like seems like they're not reactive they've they've been entirely reactive the last year at least and then there was the hell diver situation well that's react okay so hell divers is an interesting situation because people think that the 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 not moral the ethically wrong thing here is that they were asked to make an account oh it's just two minutes you don't have a problem making an account for everyone else and it's like yeah but that's not the problem the yeah. problem is, is that they waived that, sold into a bunch of countries that they don't have access 177. to. 177. Yeah, that can't buy that game normally or shouldn't be able to be or, or can't make a PSN account. And then locked the people that bought in those countries out of their accounts or out of the game because they can't create an account anyway. That is ethically wrong. And Steam, being or Valve rather, being smart enough to see that and rather than dispute the refunds, just started like immediately giving refunds to the people that couldn't access the game because fucking duh. <laughs> like, it, like it's not 4D chess from Steam. It's just Steam realizing like, oh, yes, this is this is a pickle. This is bad for us. So it's better for us to just give the money back rather than go to court in a class action lawsuit, which is where this would have gone. And that's yeah. really like people go like, oh, yeah, it's because PC players put pressure. Yes. And that's a cool victory. But I bet you it's more one lawyer looked at that and went, oh, that's a class action lawsuit. A big one, like a big, big one, like like not only everybody gets their money back, but like a little bit on top because we stole yeah. from them. We did yeah. fraud. Yeah, I, 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 to me, that's probably even more what was the, the the thing that moved the needle or the thing that got things moving was like, right. you're staring down the barrel of an insanely large lawsuit where lots and lots of people are going to get money. You're going to be paying a lot of money back to people. And then on top of it, you look you look like an asshole. An asshole. You look like a fraudster. You, you look yeah. like a thief. There was no world, but like in hindsight, there's no world where Sony stuck to its guns here. Once the once the like the monetary, you know, problem was highlighted. Like there, whatever you think of Sony, you know, whether you think all corporations are assholes, which you probably should, but whether you think that anyway, they're not stupid. They have teams of brilliant lawyers who would have seen that immediately and be like, "Oh yeah, we can't." 
<laughs> we can't do that. So probably what happened here is there was someone high up at Sony that that looked at like they wanted to boost PSN numbers. They they for whatever part of their job makes them look good with with you know really good higher PSN account numbers, PSN account creations, PSN mm -hmm. account logins. When well, this should be standard, you know. This should like you know, and and well, we need to get back to like what we said, you know, whatever. Whether they said it was going to be like this always, didn't. What they didn't pay attention to was the fact that they sold to 177 countries, right? That, that have no means of doing so. Well, I I think what happened is actually that they set this arbitrary 90 day, you know, window where because linking accounts was causing all sorts of problems on the servers. Um, you know, if you linked your account wrong, you couldn't join games. You could like there was yeah. there was a bunch of problems with linking accounts, and so they couldn't solve it in the moment. So the development team basically got permission to stop linking, but it was always like it was a ninety day. Like Sony didn't just burst this on everybody. This was a thing, and I think what happened is when they removed that requirement, Steam's you know storefront just allowed it to be bought. I, I just I don't know if I, I believe doubt it was a guy going like ooh. I, like, I just well here's the thing I just can't imagine it just there's just it just automatically got put up on storefront pages in 177 countries. Why shit if, like that is super automated? Like if it was always the plan to use a PSN account, it would never it should never have been on those storefronts. Uh so on the like back if this end, was the plan that they took away like i don't so you had a few like you always planned it to be this way and then you put it on steam it was always going to plan to use a psn account why would it show up in say um let's let um i don't know let's take the philippines for example that was a big country that was getting locked out like okay we have this game is oh it's always a plan to use it's always a plan we're just yeah. we just have to backtrack on it because we're having issues with it at launch why would it suddenly show up on the philippine store you know store page if it was always a plan not to have it i don't know if i believe that sort of automation was there and even if it was sony should have immediately addressed that within like a day or two being like oh whoa, 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 wait wait guys remember we're gonna have to link psn accounts we can't do this we, you know we can't sell to a country that doesn't have psn so I'm going to I'm going to role play here for a second because in a lot of well I shouldn't say a lot I've used a couple of CRMs but on the back end like a Shopify account so there will literally be like uh will you be selling this in such and such states and you click it and then Shopify will start collecting taxes or whatever for that mm -hmm. region right the same idea it's a little checkbox say on the back end of Steam where it's all like PSN account required and they unchecked that and then connected to that is, oh, it's now in the storefront for everything because this requirement that would have, like, because all that back end is as much of it as automated as possible. Now, I'm not saying that's what happened. I'm speculating that that's how we could have ended up here without yeah, anybody maybe, thinking yeah. about it. But like yeah. someone that that should be someone's job at Sony. Well, wow. to to make sure that you you're not selling a product to a country. How many you know? middle managers have been like, well, that should be somebody's fucking job. <laughs> like, like how many how many times have I heard my wife in a meeting going like, well, that's a whole person's job about something. And they just go, well, could you do it? Well, like, I I guarantee you they're going to be paying a lot more closer attention to this going. Oh forward. hell yeah yeah and I, and I bet you I bet you it'll no longer be a checkbox or whatever you know there's going to be some sort of verification that happens well then there's yeah. a weird example like ghost of tsushima is about to come out on pc and they say you don't need a psn account to play single player you will need a psn account to play multiplayer so how does that work does that mean they can or can't sell the game in say the philippines if you can play it without a psn account single player but you do need a psn account for multiplayer I imagine that it just won't be sold or there will be no multiplayer component in the Philippines. Right. And the easiest one would just, just not to sell it rather than like right. remove, like remove code from the game or whatever. I, but honestly, it gets you money. Well, the and other thing, the too, one that they well, here, here's the other thing, you know, what gets you money is to just drop the requirement altogether. Yeah. And I know, I know they have it in their brain. They want it. They want it so bad to, to make you link a PS. A PSN account. They want that PSN account like linkage. But if anything, this has shown you it ain't worth it, bro. 
Well, it, it, there's an interesting discussion there about ecosystem. Well, so our, our last episode of the podcast got some pretty good comments, like like actually thought out comments. And we got other comments that weren't. But um, one of the things that we didn't talk about in the exclusivity thing is that like, oh, exclusivity used to be the main idea about how to get you into an ecosystem. And we didn't directly call out that that's no longer true. And so like here you look at Helldivers where it's like they money had this to try and get more people into their ecosystem. So they, in a sense, didn't care that Helldivers was a huge success of making them lots of money because to them, having your information and having you in their ecosystem was more valuable. Uh, right. Well, I don't know if that continues. I don't know if that's true. Well, that's the thing is this is pure greed. They want your information. They want to collect it. They want to analyze it. They want to they sell, want sell it. it. <laughs> yeah. They want that's what they it. want. That's what they want more than anything because there's such a, there's such a, there's such a multi-billion dollar industry of selling your personal information mm -hmm. that goes on behind our backs all day, every day. Um, and this is what Sony really wants. They're not even, it, it almost doesn't matter the fact that they've sold like 10 million like or more hell divers two copies you know between both system you know ps5 and pc mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is, is they they want your data they want to know they want to know what you're doing they want to know what you're playing your habits your you know your info sell that info you know sell right. it to other advertisers sell it to google kind of thing it's like we can't your just play info connecting to other contact info to refine who you are and where you shop. It's if you join any rewards program at all and get discounts, I just, they're just selling your information. Like that's why you get robo calls. That's why you get, you know, emails from random spam email accounts and shit like that is directly connected. And that's what Sony is hoping to do to you. <laughs> like any of them that's what they're doing they want you for their marketing you know roles and they want you so that they can sell your information the thing that's a win about this whole hell diver situation here is that it, it proves kind of like on a on a very simple level we're talking about entertainment and this is true of actual important issues facing everybody in the world as a whole today the greatest threat to anything is apathy because if people were just largely apathetic about this, it probably would have just continued on. Yeah, it, this never would have been addressed. Yeah, like they like this goes all the way. This goes back to the Xbox One thing where people were really mad and upset over the stupidity they were trying to to launch the Xbox One on. So much so that it caused them within a week to reverse decision on the on always online requirement on the Xbox One. Yeah. Because people were upset because people pushed back. Apathy, if, if these companies can't get away, if Sony can get away with doing something incredibly shitty, incredibly like, not only just, this is completely anti-consumer. This is outright theft. If they can get away with outright theft over the majority of the country, like, you know, 177 countries in the world, if they can get away with that theft due to apathy, they would have. Oh, yeah. They absolutely would have. Yeah, if nobody would have raised the stink, you know, I, even uh, something that I felt while I was looking at this, if you played over 100 hours of that game and then you were getting a refund, it feels like you weren't an aggrieved party. You were a person who was trying to get the game for free, in a sense, because you already played 100 hours of it. And I do still feel that way. But at the same time, yeah, it's hard not to say, like, had they not been angry, everyone would have just gotten fucked up. So, yeah. well, it, I mean, it depends on where that person who logged 100 hours in, if that person was in one of these effective countries, it's sure. a pers it's a persistent world. It's an online campaign. It's an ongoing campaign. Mm -hmm. The fact that they literally just told you, well, you're from you're from this country. Goodbye. Yeah, you uh, can't. I wonder why PlayStation Network isn't available. My guess is because countries. Sony, because it's Sony and they don't have that kind of server capacity. You know, they're they're not Amazon, they're not Microsoft, they don't have this kind of network infrastructure around the world. But on the other hand, you would think there's a lot of like some of those countries you 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 kind of understand that some of those countries like, how do you not have any presence there? Well, but also like if they don't have any presence there, how are they playing in the first place? For Helldivers? Yeah, like it, it well, Steam. Right, but play uh, yeah, <laughs> but PlayStation Network, you know, if if all you yeah, okay, you have to have an account, but like you know, 
why would they not sell in those countries? Like, why would they not make the account available in those countries? Like, what infrastructure do they need to be able to have an account? No, it's just that, weird that they like it is. A, it, it honestly, it is weird. Eighty percent of the countries in the world, you're just like, we're not selling there. Why? No, I don't. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't know if this is. This is not necessarily about hell divers, but you know, something I was telling people last night, and this is you know, kind of like going, you know, telling why Nintendo should put their hardcore games on PC. Imagine you live in Brazil, and the markup in in tax in the importing rates on modern consoles in Brazil is enormous. Yeah, they All they electronic. they pay out the ass. There are people in Brazil who have to, you know are at, you know they will vacation to Mexico or North America. I'm sorry, not North America, United States of America. Mexico is part of North America. Um, they will vacation to the United States. They will vacation to Mexico. Hell, even they might even vacation to Canada. They say it is cheaper for them to fly on a plane, to the United States, buy a PlayStation Five, fly back home. It's the same with is, all Apple products. Too. Than it is to buy a PlayStation 5 in Brazil. It would cost them more just to buy a Brazilian, um, go to a Brazilian store and buy a PlayStation 5 than it is to fly to America, buy it here for like normal price and fly home. So mm -hmm. this is where it's like, okay, Steam, on the other hand, what a godsend, right? Because Steam doesn't require, you know, a specific set box top or whatever, right? And especially in Nintendo's case, how they're missing out on millions of dollars potentially, probably not even potentially, they are missing out on millions of dollars, lots of millions of dollars, um, is that they could put their Switch games like Bayonetta 2 and 3 and Xenoblade, put it on Steam and sell it in Brazil. And people in Brazil could buy it on Steam because, again, the Switch is a potato where it's so low tech that there's frankly probably, you know, even the average PC gamer in Brazil could easily run those games off of off of Steam off the PC in Brazil, and they wouldn't have to buy a really really expensive Switch down there. You know, this is a weird thing because it's also an argument that I've seen other like Brazilian visual effects teams. By the way, they fly to the United States to buy their equipment and fly back, or at least that was true ten years ago. That was like a a weird quirky thing if you were on a, a visual effects editor in Brazil. Um, but Brazil's a huge city with a giant middle class. Like they have gaming PCs. It's not like they're running potatoes. Like, yes, of course they could. No, I know potatoes. they're not, but I'm just saying, like, <laughs> I, I don't know what the import tax on say NVIDIA and AMD and Intel products. Are. I imagine, yeah. I imagine it's fair. Yeah. It, they pro it's, you know, I don't know. I, because I know, I do know for a fact, consoles are extremely expensive to sell in brazil for some whatever name yeah, reason i don't know what the weird thing is there i know that apple products are super expensive because they come from the united states not from you know like asia mm -hmm. um i'm not exactly sure what that is about but it is interesting that all consoles, all like all of them are super expensive. I wonder if there's just like a tax. Oh, yeah. I wonder if they classify them as luxury goods. I'm not sure about good. the actual specifics yeah. of it, but I'm just saying that like there are millions. There's it's a big country. Oh, there, yeah. are, there are multiple giant cities in Brazil. It's a yeah. huge, huge nation full of lots and lots of people. And because they're, they're just cut off from the because market. they're in this really weird world where the the import fees and the taxation fees on video game consoles are so super super high pc in brazil is like okay well that's a that that is an un, untapped market of of people which is why like say like arcades are you know still popular in brazil or whatever um because it's just like okay cool go to an arcade hang out you know drop you know um you know whatever whatever they use for, yeah. you know, in an arcade machine and play, play some rounds with your friends kind of thing. You know, it's, it's actually sort of interesting because Australia also taxes the shit out of video game consoles and games. Mm -hmm. And um, I, you would think just given that all consoles are manufactured in Asia, which, you know, <laughs> is basically Australia's doorstep right there, yeah. you know, uh, they're why Canada. they're paying. Yeah. Why are they paying, um, you know. Because they're paying like European exchange, you know, like they're like they're going through like a lot, like they have the same rating as a lot of times as like Europe and stuff. That's like weird. Like, it's it's so just, weird. Well, 
the world is not a very well run system honestly let's let's be real here uh you yeah you want to so the rest of the next 20 minutes is going to be about market economics and global economics and uh you can tune out now uh no but speaking of not really well run systems uh, i think the question everybody's asking today especially today uh right before we started recording this uh it was announced that microsoft was closing down four studios including tango gameworks um for all of them were Bethesda studios. All of them were under Bethesda. Yeah, it was the, they they were they're gutting Bethesda. Yeah. Um, uh, and so I guess the question is, is like, is Phil Spencer incompetent? It seems like a lot of people are commenting that Phil Spencer is incompetent or somehow uh, a dickhead. We we've this. we've kind of been on his side a lot on this podcast. I'm not gonna you know, yeah, I'm not gonna pretend we sure. weren't. But I'm also gonna tell you right now, like here's here's the other truth. Is that if Phil Spencer was fired today or retired today, which honestly, here's my take on that is knowing how much he makes, how much he made in bonuses last year. He's a multimillionaire. Yeah. yeah. He's a multimillionaire. He should have, like, Phil should have retired today. Phil should have gracefully retired, said, look, I'm not happy with where things are. I have failed, you know, to protect, you know, my studios. I'm stepping down. I have failed in my mission that I would have actually respected the hell out of him for that. And then he could go home and he could live on his fucking yacht, uh, you know, on his, you know, from all the millions of dollars he's made in the last 20 years being the head of Xbox. And he has millions of dollars. He made like 10 million and like, he made $10 million with or without bonuses last year alone. Yeah. Um, he's a millionaire and, and the respectable, honorable thing to do would have just been to retire after, after this, because the thing is, everyone's going back, and they're not even having, they don't even have to go back that far. They go back one year, and they can they have all these quotes from Phil talking about how like he believes in his teams and he loves Tango GameWorks and he's totally and he pushes for things like Hi Fi Rush and he encourages them. There's a the one year ago. Do you, do you remember when when Redfall came out and and it was a huge bomb immediately? And then he yeah. said, "We're not shutting we're not shutting down Arcane Austin. We're not going to do that." I'm not doing There's that. a little asterisk and then just in tiny font to the bottom of when he said that, it just said, yet. <laughs> yet. <laughs> yet. So, <laughs> like he said, he said like exactly one year ago or just even, even a little bit less than a year ago, like after it was apparent that Redfall was a disaster. I'm not shutting down the studio, you know. For And then there was like, oh, well, you know, these things happen. And then, then they even kind of took the blame themselves and said, yeah, we kind of pushed them into this and da, da, da. We're not going to shut them down. They're shutting down anyways. Yeah, and the, and the thing is, is this is the, the really weird thing about this is that this happened after they already fired nineteen hundred or laid off nineteen hundred people from Activision Blizzard. Yep, and various of their own studios, and now they're shutting down. Now they're just gutting Bethesda. You know, so it, it's it's. I personally, my personal feeling is that like this was time to throw into towel, Phil. Like, like I. He's old enough, whatever. Just go live the rest of your life in peace. Um, who that would have been over? The, who who could possibly? But here's the thing: for everyone calling for Phil's head and how terrible Phil is, and da da da. da do you think if Microsoft replaced Phil Spencer today, do you think Microsoft would put someone in Phil Spencer's position who was going to stand up to Satya Nadella or whoever at his his bosses at the head of Microsoft and go, no, I won't allow you to shut down or lay off any more people from Xbox? Do you think Microsoft is going to put someone like that in there? Yeah, I, I do think it's sort of uh, everybody wants Phil Spencer to be the ultimate villain in this situation where it's like i think the axe or where the axe fell was his decision but i think he was probably told the axe has to fall somewhere he was probably told like hey you got to cut this amount of cost somewhere good luck and he did it and we could uh we could probably argue about well here's why what i think or... well here's what i think because i think there is a reason why tango got let go i do well, yeah, because what in, name left? Shinji Mikami left. Well, Mikami already left, which I think was probably more just him being like seeing the writing on the wall. But here's the deal. Tokyo Ghostwire and then Hi-Fi Rush came out pretty close to each other. Uh, and, and, you know, because they had done Evil Within, they did Evil Within 2, and then they did Tokyo Ghostwire. Right. And then really not long after Tokyo Ghostwire, Hi, uh, Hi-Fi Rush came out. Tango Gameworks was years away from releasing a new game. Years away, many years away, potentially. 
No, that makes sense. Actually. They were far from they were far from any completion. They these people got gutted because these people were the farthest away from a finished product. Period. Probably this similarly is, true about Arcane. This is exactly the same thing that happened to all the studios THQ owned when THQ went under. And why did some people get bought and why did some studios get closed? Why did Darksiders studios, uh, why did that studio get closed? Because they just released Darksiders too. They were years away from anything else. The studios that had something more immediately, more more closer to completion, they got yeah. bought up. They got bought up and then eventually they could shut No, I, I didn't even think about that as an angle. Uh, and that's, that's totally true. And yeah. that's exactly what's happening here. They, the, Phil got the word, like, you need to gut stuff. Um, you need, you need to get rid of, we need, we need to cut our loss. We need to cut out some studios. We have too many. We need to get rid of them. And they either, I don't even know if Phil even decided this. They probably said, okay, Phil, someone above him. And there are people above Phil went, what studios are the farthest away from, from a finished product? And he probably gave him a list and he said, all right, well, they looked at where those studios are and just said, all right, these ones go. And he might've, he, he may have even tried to defend it, but they probably said, no. One, Tango was their only Japanese game studio, so there was probably some sort of like economic tax thing they probably had to deal with there. Um, yeah. Maybe. The other one was, you know, another studio in Austin, which probably isn't cheap. I don't know where Mad Dog Games or the, the fourth studio was, but these are all Bethesda people. So they're all, besides Tango, they're all probably in North America. Well, Tango's sort of interesting because they very much wanted they wanted that entry point into the Japanese. Yeah, market. this is the, and this really makes every every statement Phil ever said about like wanting to get further into Japan look look bad. Real well, bad. it's not even that it makes it look bad. It's just it's obvious now that uh, they aren't. It's not happening. Yeah, it wasn't like, happening. It wasn't moving. Uh, what know, is happening will just be money hats, right? And I really don't think, uh, you know, Mikami probably left, like you said, because he saw the writing on the wall, um, wanted to get away while he was on a high note and not after it closed down. Um, but Tango, Tango did some good games, but they weren't super high profile like I think Xbox want, like I think they wanted X, they wanted Tango to be like this weird flagship. It's the new, like from soft slash, uh, you know, square slash, like some sort of prestigious title. And Tango made good games, like really good games, uh, games that I really like, but they weren't prestige titles. I, my personal belief too is that is that because this is all Bethesda, there's something interesting about how it's only Bethesda, right? Um, I'm going to bet that slimy fuck, uh, over there, Todd Howard, Todd Howard had something to do with it as well. Maybe Be because the pressure probably came down on Phil, probably came down on Todd. And they probably said, Todd, you got to get rid of, we, we you got to cut four studios and Todd probably cut the four studios. He has the least control over, which were these ones. I, that would be an interesting, he, he, like the weird thing is, is like he had to, I guess it must have been personal motivations because again, you know, Tango Tango's not uh say a prestigious title, but Hi-Fi Rush did win a bunch of recognition won and won a BAFTA, you know. Yeah. Like it, it's not like they released games that were forgettable. Like they they released good games. You know, honestly, I just think it's a combination, man. It's like they were the furthest away from releasing a new game. Yeah. Todd Howard did not have day-to-day -day fucking control over his his little empire the way he does in all the other studios or most of the other studios at Bethesda. Is he that so, much of a control freak? Is that like from what I understand? Wow. Because there was that one guy, he was one of the lead designers on on Elder Scrolls, and he and, you know, he had that really great sort of dissection where it's just like yeah, he, he is what he is, but he's also very good at picking what people do want to see. They're like, yeah, like, you know, he's a micro, yeah, he's a micromanager, but it's like, he's also very good at knowing what gameplay features are going to hit and what ones are not too. So, but like, the thing is, is like the dude self inserts himself all over the place. Like 
like when that Indiana Jones thing direct, that's machine games. That's not like Bethesda's main offices or anything like that. Yet here he is He's in the- talking about, hey, this was my idea. This was my story. I want to do this my whole life. So I got this great idea. I got this great thing going at this game studio. He didn't start. He doesn't run. You know, he runs in the sense that he's the head of Bethesda kind of thing. But like, again, there's, there's, I'm speaking a little out of my ass here, but there's everything I've ever heard from anyone who's ever haven't encountered this, this, this slime ball. Like this sounds to me a little bit like it was odd, like, you know, one of it was very practical. They're the furthest away from completion. Mm-hmm. You have to gut some people. These are the people who are not going to produce any results for years Two. I don't really like these people. I don't know them. They're not my friends. They're they're not they're not people I hang out with. They're not people I you know I you know fly off to you know vacation with or anything. These are just these are not just, these are people I own. These are not people I I hang out with or or fraternize or socialize with. An easy cut because he doesn't have a personal relationship or connection to them. Yeah, bingo. And and I think that yeah. and, and and that's probably what he told Phil. And Phil probably went, "Are you sure? Like this seems like a bad idea." Yeah, okay. But, you know, there's probably people above Phil and, you know, above, above Todd, above Phil, who are just kind of like, well, you got to gut, you got to gut these many people. We got to, we're, we're not paying for studio. We, and we don't mean like downsize the studio. We mean get Kill rid the of the studio. studio. Yeah. We don't want to pay rent. We don't want to pay anything. Like you need to get rid of some people who's, who's not, who's not going to have anything out for years. And, you know, here we are in May 7th, 2024. And, oh, look at the time. We have about 12 months. I'm feeling like Ninja Theory is going to be gone too. No, absolutely, absolutely, no fucking. They spent it. seven years, seven years for Hellblade Two, which is mostly a techno, an eight-hour game that will be on Game Pass. Uh, that that has cost lots of money and whatever. They're gone. They are not lasting very long. Like, but like, I twelve months. I will see you later. But Ninja Hellblade. Theory is a prestige dev like they are a they're name se- but they're not they're not selling horizon numbers they're not uh, selling god of war numbers and it took them seven years to make an eight hour sequel to an eight hour game no don't that's care fair. don't care how great your audio and graphics and everything are like this is this is business this isn't personal this is business uh i i would if i was at if i was at ninja theory i'd be looking for other work oh Oh, that's a, you know what? The thing is, is you've been prophetic about a few things, not least of which is that Nintendo uh, little tweet that was going to be a, like people have already called it out. Patrons and stuff have already called it out where they're all like, wow, Prophet Prophet Simmons is fucking calling out Nintendo. Um, I just, I I told them very charitably that uh, you were a Nintendo for so long that you know them so well. Yep. (laughs) <laughs> Don't, the, it's it's a joke but it's true it's true <laughs> yeah um yeah i as a final thought on this it's like i don't we've been called phil spencer apologists before and part of it is that i do legitimately think he he understands here's, the industry here's the thing but, i think i think phil means well but like at the end of the day again my personal opinion now is just like he's been ineffective well phil yeah, you tried. And the thing is, is the, the the longer you stick around like this, because the reality is, here's the reality. He's going to have to keep making cuts. He's yeah. going to have to keep laying people off. He's going to have to keep shutting studios down. If Phil was smart, he would have retired at the end of last year. Personally. Yeah, it, it makes me wonder, though, it's like... Now, Microsoft wouldn't have liked that because it, again, would have made them like look bad again because they looked bad at the start of the year. You know, and then it would have made them look even worse. But I mean, not Phil's problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, the the industry, uh, you know, some people are it like, oh, the industry is in a death spiral. It's not in a death spiral. It's definitely having a major culling. Like it is, it is cutting way back. Uh, well, again, project management is been in a crisis. I've been saying that for years, and boy, do I keep getting turned around. You know what else keeps? You know what else has also been proven right? How effective. Peter Moore was at his job. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, when you first said that, because I think we were talking about like the Sega episodes, like episode three of the podcast ever. Yeah. Uh, and you said that, do you remember that we got pushback about Peter Moore being as responsible for the success of, uh, well, I think at the time it was like Sega and then 
Um, yeah. Let's all, and it's like more and more as time goes on, the Peter Moore show is just like, <laughs> dude killed it. I don't know how he was so good, but he was. Um, I We're not going to have like a death spiral here. Microsoft has enough money that it is going to survive whatever this is. Nintendo has enough money that it is going to survive whatever this is. Will Sony? Mm, the only reason I think Sony is in a pickle is not because they, of the three, have the least amount of money, which they do. But Sony, the overall umbrella company, is sort of having problems in several sectors. Which means PlayStation, even though PlayStation is still killing it, means that they're in a little bit of a trouble spot. Now, it's not like Sony's like on the verge of death or something, but compared yeah. to the other two of the big three, they're they're sort of. They're I think limping. below. I think both below the surface, Sony's not as healthy as you would honestly think. Right. Because like the PSVR two has been pretty much an unmitigated disaster. Um, again, they're laying off people from their most successful studios as well. Like I, the PlayStation Portal is a yeah. disaster, as far as I know. Um, you know, basically everything they've done outside of their main console has been a bit of a disaster. And the AAA games, obviously, they're the best triple. I would say, if you take it all together, Sony's AAA titles are probably the top of the line currently. Like, if you're talking graphics, you're talking story, you're talking yeah, yeah. all put together. Yes, Sony's AAA titles are the best in, in the business. But if right. anything, that Insomniac League showed us, like, holy God, they're spending way too much money on this. Way too much money. And it's, a you know, we had this point brought up on the last episode where it's like, AAA titles cannot be loss leaders. They're too expensive. You can't. Like you can't sit there and be like, "Oh, it's it's just a loss leader to get you into the ecosystem." I'm sorry, but the ecosystem just isn't that valuable. It's not that valuable. Um, you know, it's a lot like it's valuable in the long term, but you can't mm -hmm. take huge losses or barely break even on your AAA titles when they're costing three hundred million dollars to do. That's just like, and I'm not even a business guy. You just look at that and you're like, that math, no math. That being said, I don't think Sony's going to like shut down or I, I don't think Sony's going to shut PlayStation down. But I do think there is an interesting world where if this downturn goes too long for the industry, there is an interesting world where maybe PlayStation gets sold or split off. I, you know, I, I think it's going to depend Maybe. a lot, a lot on 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 just kind of where the end of this generation goes, because, you know, maybe Sony embraces PC gaming more. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's hard to say, because the thing is, is like they're selling consoles. They are they are selling. Oh, yeah, they are selling consoles. But um, the hardware or no, sorry, the software outside of a couple of them, like Spider-Man 2 sold really well, but like the software is OK. It's right. not like blowing the doors off. Like Rebirth was a great example. 16 was a great example. Um, I don't know how well Rise of the Ronin or Stellar Blade will do by the end of the year. They'll probably do okay. They'll probably do a few million, maybe. But it's like you can't sell. For Sony, I don't really know if, if selling two to three million of an exclusive is worth it. Is enough, yeah. Because, and, and, and it's not like it's going to hurt them, them necessarily, but what they'll do is like, well, there's no one, well, stop the money hats. You know, we don't need to be spending game budgets right. on exclusivity for, say, a Final Fantasy when it's not gonna it's not gonna bring us back that many numbers anymore. And then maybe that's a Final Fantasy problem. You know, maybe Stellar Blade will sell like ten million copies. Who knows? And look, I mean, it's a huge what if to say that like PlayStation could end up sold off. I understand that, and it's like ninety nine percent not going to happen. Um, but I do think that like these layoffs do have an effect. There's a reason layoffs happen. And it is usually because the industry is unhealthy in some way. Um, yes, they're bringing in massive profits, but they have overexpanded. I think that that's clear. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, I would say that Nintendo is probably pretty healthy. Of the three, it's probably the healthiest. They sort of focus on sustainability. But the real problem here is that 
the, 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 the true thing, the true thing that makes all this thing, all the terrible things happening is infinite growth. The idea right. that you can have infinite growth, the idea that the entertainment industry is played by as many players as it is, and you want to somehow grow it. Yeah, I, I do think that there's going to have to be a philosophy change somewhere. Yeah, and I don't, and I don't know, I don't know if any, I, I don't know how you get out of this, this sort of corporatist hellhole here. But the, the reality is, is you need to find a way to be at peace with just being profitable. Yeah. Like being profitable needs to be more valued than growth. Uh, yeah. Well, that's uh, going back to my big brain theory is like tech bros infecting everything where market cap is more important than profitability in tech. That's been sort of the guiding star for the last 15 years. And uh, look at all the problems the tech sector is having. Like the guiding star of growth at all costs. Not working out for them. Where's well, actually, all the venture capitalists eventually, now? Eventually, you have no one to run your your company anymore, and you have no one to work the you know work the factory. You laid everyone yeah. off. <laughs> On that note, we do have some patrons to thank. Uh, not a high note to end on, but this is rough news all around. So, sorry guys, but our producers for this episode are Osnite, Cybernite, Button Chops Johnson, Screwed Army, Croy Thirty Five, Hyper Viper Eighty Nine. Hockey Kong 64, LCL Mayhem, and Ziggy Z. Thank you, dudes. We'll catch you next time. Later, dudes.